Hello, everybody. It looks like we have, oh, there's Liz, hello. Good, we've got you in the, uh, coming into the meeting and greetings everyone. Welcome back or welcome if it's your first time here. Uh, super, we're just gonna give people a couple of minutes. We have about three minutes left. And so I will just go to a blank screen here and I'll see you all in three minutes. Thanks for being here. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, for those of you who might have just been on the 20-hour broadcast, Kate, uh, this is for you. Um, we had to shut that one off to start this one, so my apologies if you were caught in that, but, uh, but it was all intentional, and we were supposed to wrap that one up a little bit early, and apparently uh, it ran over a bit. Anyway, welcome back, everybody. I'm really glad that you're here with us today. This is part three of our fair housing series uh, that was ostensibly in honor of fair housing month but we've stretched over into may for the last part of it and we're going to be going through a number of different things i'm just going to share my screen here and hang on one second let me just pull this up and here we are fair housing three and i'm going to share that with you and then we will get started with today's content. So thank you all for being on time and uh, we will do our very best to honor your time today and take full advantage of it and of your presence with us. Like last week and the week before, I am hoping that this will be a very interactive class. And uh, just to give you an idea of the things that we're going to cover, going to be talking about, again, this notion of intent versus impact. It's probably one of the most foundational aspects of what we need to be paying attention to in fair housing. 
We'll talk about your patterns of practice, the baseline expectations. Those are pretty much the three key, uh, key components of the things that we'll be covering. We, uh, we just in quick review, we've already covered uh, some of the issues pertinent to the seven protected classes, the federally protected classes. We've covered race, we've cover, covered color. We've touched on religion with our discussion last week of the Muslim and Islamic community. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit more about religion, but we're also going to talk about sex and sex discrimination, uh, disability, familial status, national origin, and we're also going to cover some groups of people who are not protected within the seven protected classes federally. So we're going to start with a little glance at religion in America that picks up pretty much where we left off last week. We'll talk about persons with disabilities and some new frontiers relative to disabilities that several of you have asked about. Talk about sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, two parts of the LGBT community. We'll talk about service dogs, which also relate to persons with disabilities and emotional support animals. And we'll talk about a concept called disparate impact, which of course means treating someone differently than other people are treated and the specific reason that that's in the news these days. We'll talk about what is in the headlines and what's on the court dockets at pretty much every level and um, and judicial system within our country, because there are a lot, a lot of things that actually relate to fair housing in very specific and also uh, very general ways. So that's today's agenda. And again, I thank you for being with us. So last week, we sort of left off with a very interesting discussion about niche marketing and what is acceptable within niche marketing. And I can tell you that the things that we talked about, you can see that we had the Christian real estate um, site, the, the uh, evangelical site. We had the Mormon, evangel the Mormon um, religious site for LDS agents, Latter-day Saints. And we had the one representing the Islamic faith with um, Muslim persons being able to go to this individual for um, both real estate and financing advice. So it engendered some really interesting conversation. And I want to thank Kim DiCarlo from our Murraysville, Pennsylvania office for writing me an extremely thoughtful email. And I'm going to share it with you and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. So it's story time to kick off our class. Kim said, um, thank you for sending us the PowerPoint presentation. I always enjoy your classes, blah, blah, blah. Kim said, I wanted to share some thoughts I had regarding the second session of the Fair Housing webinar. During the discussion of niche marketing, I noticed some very negative comments in the chat toward the Christian brokers advertisement. I wasn't surprised at this as a societal reaction in general, but I was surprised that so many agents reacted negatively toward another person's religious beliefs. As we all know, negative opinions toward certain religions is one of the issues in our society that's necessitated the fair housing law. I noticed comments like, we are better than this and I'm suspicious. Wouldn't we all be horrified if a Howard Hanna agent or anyone voiced suspicions of the Muslim agent showed in the subsequent ad? Many people responded negatively toward the evangelical Christian ad, assuming the worst about this company and the people who work there. This is only my opinion, and I know that it may not be a popular one, but I feel that our society, in an attempt to right past wrongs and current ones, has taken on an assumption that evangelical Christians are racist or prejudiced toward racial minorities and other groups such as the LGBTQ community. For instance, is not a negative perception of evangelicals the same as a negative perception toward Muslims or Sikhs? Would those agents who stated they would never work with the Christian broker feel the same way about working with a client who shared the same beliefs as this broker? I'm not an evangelical Christian, and I was not personally offended by the comments that people made. However, there may have been some participants in the webinar who were. More importantly, we as agents need to treat all people fairly, whether we agree with their religious beliefs or not. If someone outside our company was watching the webinar yesterday and saw the negative comments by so many of our agents, what would their impression be? Would they be assured that Howard Hanna agents treat all people fairly. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts. I appreciate your time, Kim DiCarlo. 
Kim and I have had a couple of conversations about this um, since she had the courage to send me that email and uh, some very good conversations. But I would really, really love to hear what you all have to say and what your thoughts are on this topic. So if you would, let's see, please go into the chat area and tell me a little bit about what your thoughts are. And I have to get in here and just Whoops. For some reason I'm not seeing my own. There we go. Okay, so chat. We've got a couple of things in chat. Um, Kate said, I was raised to treat people the way you want to be treated, right? And um, Kathy said, I applaud Kim for writing that. Those were my exact thoughts the other day. I am a Christian and was very offended by the comments. And uh, Suzanne is writing something. And keep them coming, gang. Let's see what those thoughts are. Anything? Linda says, I didn't even think the type of advertising was allowed in agent affiliating with a particular religion. Linda, we're going to talk about that. Everyone is entitled to purchase if qualified. And uh, Suzanne said, I'm not happy with negative comments regarding other faiths. Kim is spot on. I agree with the email. We are a diverse country. And that is, after all, the purpose of these webinars. As professionals, we should always treat people fairly and honestly, and our methods should always be consistent, period. Thank you, Mike. I agree. I applaud Kim for her letter. I agree. Discrimination and reverse discrimination are both horrible things. That's an interesting perspective, John. Uh, it does not feel good to the person or persons that are targeted, absolutely, or that feel targeted. I thought that, I thought that as well. And I think that a lot of our social media posts, uh, yeah, I think that in a lot of social media posts I've been seeing, being overly supportive of one point of view can seem to others that you're critical of them. And I think that's absolutely true. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that's a really valid point. And I, I appreciate everybody weighing in on that. So thank you all. Because it's, um, it's a really different perspective when you are on the receiving end of something that can feel very much like negativity. And so to go back to the question about whether these types of advertising are allowed at all within our profession, the answer is they are under one circumstance and one condition. The condition has to be that you're marketing to the community at large, not to a niche in the rest of your marketing. Everybody is allowed to market to a niche that may be a special interest niche, even if it's based on membership in a protected class or trying to appeal to a protected class. So you can do demographic and psychographic niche marketing, but it cannot be as a licensee in whatever state you're licensed in, it can't be to the exclusion of your more general marketing expectations. I hope that makes sense. So. Uh, let's see. Mary Jane just said, we all want to be accepted. Learning more about the culture and the proper approach courtesies to other ethnic groups would be helpful. Although the beginning with, uh, be, beginning with a sincere smile is an icebreaker. I agree with you completely, Mary Jane. Um, and honestly, isn't it also the universal language? It really is interesting. Philomena said, I agree with Kim's statements. I too was raised Christian and I am still Christian. And uh, several comments made would definitely offend a Christian. I can separate my personal and business thoughts, but not all people can. So there's, there's the really interesting topic that we're going to hit upon today. And the question becomes, so can you? Can you really separate who you are and what you believe from your business practice? And can we pivot in the things that are perhaps deeply felt and deeply uh, held beliefs to make sure that all people are serviced properly. I believe that we can, I think it takes some work. And um, 
Amy said, so basically inclusion, not exclusion. Absolutely. That's the way to go. Michael said, I advertise in the pink pages, the gay community, but I serve the whole community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And lots of people do. Lots of people who are not members of the gay community market to the gay community because what you will find with any of the groups of people that we've talked about in past classes and today is that when you earn people's trust and loyalty and they are people who feel that they have experienced any aspect of discrimination, they are people who become very loyal. Now, Mary Jane says, I don't think so. Our heart and mind is one. That's a really interesting view. And I think there's validity and we constantly do this, this balancing act. Can you separate what is intrinsic to your belief system from the people that we're uh, meant to serve? It's kind of interesting. I think that what's happening, and we're going to talk about this, is that the stratification in our country has led to some perhaps challenging beliefs when we're dealing with people who are different from us or whom we perceive to be different from us. Junie said there's no room for any kind of discrimination in our business. Everyone deserves the best job we can provide them. And so we, you know, we talked a little bit about um, hearts and minds and how challenging it can be to make hearts and minds pivot. I personally believe that we really have to be challenged with that. Um, Linda just said, when you asked if I would work with an agent that expresses their faith walk, I felt if it were the same faith. It is a sphere of influence outside, noting an inclusion, not, uh, not an exclusion. Um, that's interesting. I think it, you know, we can be very interested in other person's faith beliefs without necessarily sharing them. And I think the pivotal part of that would be being able to be respectful. Barbara just said a good movie called The Green Book is a good movie about discrimination. You can get it at the library. It was a very popular movie, won a bunch of Oscars. And uh, it's a great movie on a number of different fronts. But mostly what it's great about is talking about servicing and working with someone different from you. And that's what we all need to be paying attention to. Mary Jane said, I've been discriminated against. The person for I met for the appointment met me so graciously that the other persons there instantly changed their attitude. I smiled and moved forward. Um, let's see, Danielle said, I don't discuss religion with clients. If they ask, then yes, I'm Christian. Whether or not they are, it doesn't matter to me. I believe in equality in all aspects. I don't care what a person is as long as they're kind and respectful in their interaction with me. And I think that's the way most of us would feel. Danielle says, I've been doing this too long to slow uh, anyone to mistreat, to allow anyone to mistreat me. And that right there sums up the people I won't work with. Those who are unkind, rude, dishonest, or disrespectful. I don't need that in my life. And I totally agree. Mike said, follow the golden rule. Let me elevate that, Mike. I would go so far as to say, follow the platinum rule. The platinum rule is where we talk about not only treating people as we wish to be treated, but treating them as they wish to be treated. And so it takes it to another level and necessitates that we find out how they wish to be treated. And I think it's something that we owe them. Roseanne weighed in and said, everyone is a person who deserves the same rights and opportunities. We're all people, human beings who are entitled to respect and kindness. And again, the golden rule. Good comments, gang. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I want to touch a little bit on this concept of facts versus feelings. We all deal with facts. We deal with facts all the time. We look at the U.S. Census. Those are facts. And then we have the Monday morning phone call after a very busy week, weekend of open houses. And invariably, if you're working in either our corporate office or our home office, when the phone rings and you're somebody in the building with a license, you may get those calls to filter and find out what consumers are asking about on Monday. On Monday mornings, when we're in a very busy seller's market, a huge percentage of those calls are actually from would-be home buyers who may have put an offer in over the weekend and had it turned down. And they believe that they have experienced discrimination. Generally speaking, in that kind of a market and under those kinds of circumstances, I believe that they have experienced a multiple offer where they didn't know what was happening and where a house was sold out from under them. And according to all of the rules that we abide by when it comes to 
multiple offers, we don't have to alert anyone that there are other offers on the table unless that is the seller's instruction. But the feeling side of what happens to somebody in that circumstance may be 180 degrees away from what happens with the facts. There are often facts that we don't know about that influence something that to an onlooker or to somebody in the midst of a transactional situation may feel absolutely like it's discrimination. And so we deal with that balancing act of facts versus feeling all the time. And it's a lot of what we're going to be talking about. So Kim, thank you again. Thank you all for your very thoughtful comments. And I think it's very interesting. I think that, that it goes back to this concept of other. Are people like me or are they unlike me? Will they accept me or will they reject me? Are they people that are going to get me? Or are they people that are going to set me aside as being rejected? And a lot of that is what resonates in the feeling side of this balancing act between facts and feelings. So, excuse me, we'll move right on. And I placed this topic here in conjunction with the topic of religion, because where we see in our country a tremendous disconnect right now is with some members of faith communities and people who identify themselves as being in the LGBTQ community. Uh, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender questioning community or queer community, depending on who's interpreting that acronym. And so Ellen has pretty much put a face on the lesbian and gay community for our country. And uh, I love her. Everybody loves her. Who doesn't love Ellen DeGeneres? She's hilarious. She's approachable. She's somebody that we would all enjoy having as a friend. And a number of years ago, Ellen was chosen to be the new spokesperson for J.C. Penney. I don't know if you all remember, but what happened when Ellen was picked for J.C. Penney is that there was a group that called themselves the Million Moms. Actually, it turned out that they were closer to 100,000. There weren't a million of them. But about 100,000 people signed a petition that they wanted Ellen removed as J.C. Penney's spokesperson. Now, they didn't really have any um, explanation of it, except that they felt that she was not a suitable spokesperson for the department store that they cared about, based on the fact that she is openly lesbian. What is really interesting about our world right now and about our ability to communicate with each other with either a Facebook post, a tweet, something flying over the airwaves, however, however we communicate, is that within 24 hours, there were well over 100,000 people who named themselves 1 million people who support Ellen for J.C. Penney. And so we had these countervailing opinions. And it's something that our, our retail and um, vendor community really has to take a look at. There are boycotts threatened, particularly on this topic, all the time. If you followed the TV show Will and Grace, if you followed any number of TV shows that have ever dealt with sexual orientation, including Ellen's show, there were boycotts that were threatened to take the advertisers and put them at a disadvantage by very conservative groups. So generally speaking, where we have persons from certain religious groups, they tend to be on the conservative side. And they are religious groups who do not believe that LGBTQ people should be represented in the media, in our society, in ways that are happening in America right now. Now we have to take that and apply it to our topical discussion of fair housing. So where does that take us? Well, it's kind of interesting. This is a map of the United States. And you can see that in this map, we actually have states that are in blue. And the states that are in blue are states with full protections. Um, they are, there are 22 states, and the states that are represented in our Howard Hanna footprint include New York, Virginia, and that tiny little bit of Maryland where some of our agents live and work. Two of the states, the ones that are on this map in yellow, Indiana and Wisconsin, have protections based only on sexual orientation, not on orientation plus gender identity. So uh, the blue states have housing discrimination guidelines that are law. 
for everybody based on both orienta orientation and gender identity. We're going to talk about gender identity a little bit later separately. But for orientation, that's less than half the country that have statewide protections. We already covered the fact that there are no federal protections. So what does this mean to your clients who fall into the orientation spectrum to be a lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, transgender, which actually falls under gender, but also the, the spectrum falls perhaps under orientation, um, or questioning or queer person by self-identifying. How does that have an impact? Well, it has an impact on how people can take title and what the state laws are relative to them taking title of the house together. Mostly it has to do with how people are treated and how they're treated in the search or sale of a home. Um, I actually was teaching a class one time, uh, a brand new agent class, where someone in the back of the room piped up when I was uh, talking about an issue that involves sexual orientation. And she said, you know, I understand exactly what you're saying. When my husband and I were looking for a house, I went into a house and, and it was very clear that gay men lived there. And I thought, why? How was that clear? She didn't elaborate. And she said, and I immediately thought, well, that is not the house for us. So I can't let that sit. So I asked her what it was that indicated that gay men lived in the house. And she said that there were pictures, there were pictures everywhere. So immediately my mind is going to a place where I'm like, oh, pictures, what kind of pictures would there be? And I asked her, I said, what kind of pictures? And she said, they were at Disney World and it was gay day. Okay, so gay men in Mouseketeer ears. So I wasn't, I really wasn't getting her point about why that wasn't a house for them. And I thought, well, the pictures aren't going to stay in the house. Obviously, they're going to take them with them. And the men themselves aren't going to stay in the house. So why isn't it a house for you and your family? And she said, I just couldn't live in a house that gay people lived in. My suggestion to her privately after class was over was that really she needed to take a look at that or really possibly reconsider whether this was a career path in which she would be able to be comfortable. Because I don't think any of us can afford that kind of bias. We are all born with bias. But when bias translates into prejudice and prejudice translates into discrimination, it's a very slippery slope that nobody with a real estate license can afford to be on. And so I, I hope that we will all look at our hearts and minds on all of the groups of people that we're talking about and ask that question, can we, in our hearts and minds, and I think it was Mary Jane who said, as one, I think they're pretty unified. Can we treat all people fairly, honestly, and respectfully based on our sincerely held beliefs? And if the answer isn't yes, might we be open enough to have our thoughts and feelings pivoted a little bit by our experience with those persons? Because if we can, I think there's tremendous hope for us. And if we can't, I think we really, you know, kind of need to take a look at that. So that's, uh, that's my personal opinion on that. Let me just find where my little arrow is here and see if we have anything else going on. The source of these statistics is the Human Rights Campaign. The, the states that are in the gray area, and many of ours are Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, and uh, uh, part of West Virginia, I mean, West Virginia is in the gray area. We have offices in West Virginia. And um, in those areas, there are local ordinances that protect this particular group of people, but you need to know within your own states where those local ordinances apply. So. Discrimination in general, discrimination complaints in the United States, uh, the stats that I was able to find on this go back to 2017 and they were published in 18. They update these all the time, but there was nothing readily available for the last year. But there were 28,843 complaints of housing discrimination in 2017. And I think we touched upon this. The three most common types of complaints in 2017 were those based on disability with 57% based on disability, which is an extraordinary number. Race, 19%, and that is the one that has always held very strong. And familial status, uh, discrimination against families with children, 
under the age of 18 and pregnant women. What do you guys think is the biggest obstacle to fair housing rights today, right now? What do you think? What is the biggest thing in the way of people being treated fairly and honestly? Let's chat. biggest obstacle. Race. Susan said religion. Patricia said race. What else? What do the rest of you think? People with service or companion am animals. We're going to cover that. Um, Kate said no idea. Political views. Thank you, Linda. Gender, nationality, sources of income. Absolutely, gender, gender, political. And by gender, um, I'm not sure if you mean gender identity or sex, meaning male or female, nationality. They're all still impediments. But I do want to go into this concept. Thank you, gender and religion, interesting. Gender identity, nationality, and marital status. Money and credit scores. Now, Louise, that's, that's a legitimate one. That is actually not discriminatory, but it is unfortunate. If people don't have the money and don't have the credit scores that would enable them to buy a house, our job is to help them get on the path to being there. But money and credit scoring and the ability to buy, the ability to become pre-approved is something that is not actually a basis for discrimination. That one would count pretty much as a basis for discernment because we certainly don't want people being disappointed by being led down a path that says that they think that they can afford a house and it turns out after we've already taken them out to look at houses that they can't. Um, this class is in no way intending to be a class to discuss politics, but I think that we would be remiss. And um, Tony, thank you for putting that in there, political, and he said, I'm near a military base. I think that we would be remiss if we didn't discuss the fact that our country is more politically um, stratified right now than at any time in modern history. And if we're looking at a country where half of the country literally be believes one thing and the other half of the country believes another, and we have these two groups of people clashing together constantly, have we not just seen this with COVID-19 and with people demonstrating to either keep the country safe from this virus that's attacking us or get the country back to work. And their strongest sentiments lean in one direction or another. Their ideologies came clashing together, um, most recently in the Michigan State House last week, where people in the State House were being threatened by people who were carrying openly carrying weapons, which is allowable in Michigan. That's a really scary encounter, person to person. And, um, and it's very interesting. Uh, Kate just said something interesting. Uh, we are poli politically polarized, Michael said. And Kate just said, I'm cranky today. Could it be that the biggest obstacle is people that won't think? I, you know, Kate, I think it goes again back to that question of thinking and feeling. And I think that um, that I think maybe the bigger obstacle is people that won't think like we do, you know, because there's always a good argument on the other side of anything. I think it's Dr. Phil that has been amply qu quoted as saying that, you know, no matter how flat you make a pancake, there's two sides to it. And that is true. And so I think that we have to take a look at that because it's the same reason that we apply to why we don't want to see your Facebook be overtaken, or at least your business page, be overtaken with political rants. Everybody has a political opinion in America right now, but we are remiss if we're not recognizing that we dismiss about 50% of the people who might want to work with us to buy a house and with whom we might find some other kind of common ground beyond the political scene if we don't pay attention to where we project ourselves into the marketplace as thinking and feeling beings. And so I just want to caution everybody because this notion of discrimination, discernment, division is something that can really get in our way if we don't watch it. Because I think that to a degree we are all capable 
of providing very fine service to people with whom we don't have certain commonalities. We don't have to be friends forever. We have to be service providers. And if we don't think that we can be because of those either political or ideological or just feeling-based differences, we need to refer that person to someone with whom they can have that commonality and perhaps get along better and have a more meaningful experience in feeling that they can express themselves candidly. So it's just an interesting thought and, and I appreciate your feedback. Um, there, the answer to that question that I found in the article that it was talking about was that the uh, political stratification in America today really leads to the federal government's failure to vigorously enforce fair housing laws and prosecute hate crimes. So that sort of becomes a chicken and egg question. Is the government not being responsible because it doesn't agree with federal fair housing laws and the hate crimes laws? Or is there a different perspective that says that they are not what they appear to be? You know? kind of interesting and it's certainly an ongoing conversation that we're not going to solve within this hour, but thank you for indulging me. So we go into the concept of persons with disabilities and this is a really significant area. And the things that, uh, that we know about people with disabilities and the difficulties that they're having in the home buying and uh, in cases of, of home sales market right now have to do mostly with rentals the complaints that came in that comprised 57% of the fair housing complaints in uh, 2017, a lot of those complaints, more than half, had to do with rental dwellings where reasonable accommodations had not been made for persons with disabilities, whether it had to do with retrofitting door frames so that people in wheelchairs could get through, grab bars, access to upper floors, whatever it was, rental had a lot to do with it. But I wanted to call to your attention three different organizations that if you're dealing with anyone with disabilities, the Department of Housing, Department of Housing and Urban Development um, can be very helpful, as can Fannie Mae's Community Home Choice with PHFA Access Modification. That's an organization that's run by Fannie Mae, and it offers financial aid for people who have disabilities or for people who share a residence with a person, a family member, or someone with whom they're they're uh, bound in housing who has a disability. The primary goal of this organization is to help buyers purchase a home that offers greater accessibility or to retrofit the current dwelling in which those persons are living. So there is help available out there and there's financial help available and this is one of the places that does it. Uh, many of the persons with disabilities who are coming into the home buying market are people who have also served our country as members of the armed forces. And so we get into the group Home for Our Troops. That too is a nonprofit program designed to help permanently injured veterans buy their own homes. And through the fundraising and volunteer efforts that have been made, this organization either builds a new home for the veteran or retrofits an existing home to accommodate their disability. For more information on that very reputable program, the uh, URL is homesforourtroops.org. And of course, I will send you all of this information at the conclusion of class. I'll send you the PDF that we have here that we're looking at. And finally, the National Organization on Disability, nod.org. By all means, um, take a look at the, uh, at the URL there and check out what these organizations have to offer and, uh, and check with them and find out if they would subsequently be able to direct you to other organizations for the specific disabilities that your clients or the people with whom you're trying uh, to arrange assistance may have. And so let me just see what our comments have here. Mary Jane just said, perhaps it would be wise to develop fair housing word tracks I think you're in New York State, Mary Jane. That is uh, that is actually something that we hear a lot up in the Buffalo market. Uh, for the process of real estate, qualify, know, show, transact. Only we can fall into the trap of possibly, um, I don't know what that means, but the intention of the prospective seller and buyer in the marketplace. Um, and so, so that's, yeah, I think that, that, that word tracks are, 
important. The thing that I hesitate with giving word tracks or any other kind of scripting, I think that it can become too rote. I'm a big fan of knowing what we need to say and then putting it into our own words. But I do agree that giving everybody some hints about some of the ways that we can position things that are acceptable versus unacceptable. And that's a, that's a good suggestion. So we will definitely take a look at that. And um, Liz just said, I see listings that check disability as a feature that the house is accommodating to persons with disabilities but uh, the homes are not necessarily accessible. Interesting. And uh, let's see, Roman said the Gary Sinise Foundation, absolutely, who played Sergeant Dan in the, in the movies, builds homes for disabled veterans. If you go on to do a Google search for any of these topics, gang, I promise you, you're going to find some really interesting things, but these are great suggestions. Thank you very much. Okay, so here we are, the new frontier and discrimination claims, the one that everybody's been asking about. And this one is service and emotional support animals. Let's start with the notion that service and emotional support animals are not pets. We know that, but it is something that we really do need to be paying attention to. And, uh, and they are not to be treated as pets. They are not to be positioned as pets. And we have to make sure that anyone who comes to us alerting us of a disability that is based on the requirement to have either a, so, a service animal, service animals can only be dogs, or an emotional support animal, we have to really be on point to respect that and to treat it properly. So uh, the distinction, let me just identify, only dogs can serve as service animals. There are specific training programs. Back to the uh, Gary Sinise Foundation, there are service dogs that, for example, for wounded veterans, can pick things up off the floor, can carry things for their, for their person. And they literally provide assistance services and things that, um, that we have to be very, very careful about. But that is a qualification in an animal that actually has certification. It has very specific uh, skill sets that the animal has to have, the dog has to have. It is different from an emotional support animal or a um, companion animal, what they call a companion animal. And so persons with any kinds of disabilities, and we can't see every kind of disability, can we? We can't see perhaps a mental disability, an emotional disability. Once again, just like what's in people's hearts and minds, we have no idea what people are going through and we certainly don't know what they're experiencing when they come to us. There are phobias and anxieties and things that are mental and emotional conditions that are extremely real. They are being treated medically uh, for those conditions in many cases, and we don't need to have an opinion about that. Specifically, we need not to have an opinion about that. But this physical or mental impairment that substantially limits what they can do within their major life activities, they may, uh, request appropriately that they receive what the law calls a reasonable accommodation for having that assistance animal with them. So the question becomes, does the animal work? Does the animal provide assistance, perform tasks or services for the benefit of the person with a disability or provide emotional support that alleviates one or more of the symptoms that come with this disability? The protections for service dogs, again, are very well defined. And the law is far less specific when it comes to the parameters that embrace the emotional support or companion animals. Uh, Kim just said everyone claims an emotional support animal these days. Unfortunately, that has slipped in and through the availability of things that we can buy online and the cute little vests like the one that Bunny has on there um, that say that he is a, an emotional support animal, that's true. And uh, somebody, Liz just said, I had to deal with a buyer who did not need an emotional support animal, told her so, but got the certificate so that the homeowners association had to allow it. This is where it encroaches on other people's rights. You know, we started with week one talking about what are my pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Where do the boundaries end for my pursuit of that and begin for yours? You know, it's my right to throw a punch, but it ends before it reaches your face. So with emotional support animals, where's the balancing act? 
we frequently have calls about this topic where somebody says, I have a client with a, an emotional support dog, but I have another client whose house they want to see where a child has very serious allergies. And we have to be extremely careful that we're not making a decision that favors one of those people over the other. That discretion is not in our court. So let me throw you all right back to your managers on that one. That is the kind of call that would probably require some consulting with our legal department. And so the step would be for you that you take that to your manager and your manager take that uh, question to our legal department. We're gonna get to that in a minute. Michael just said, I had a renter claim he needed a pit bull as a comfort dog after he moved in. Who knows? You know, I mean, that, that may be true if that was that person's pet. Uh, and as their emotional support became required, that they needed that particular animal. Again, not ours to, to contest or argue with, but an HOA that may have an outstanding prohibition against what they call the bully breeds, the dogs that you know, are pit bulls, Rottweilers, other dogs that, that a lot of HOAs have opinions about. We don't need to be in the middle of that kind of a dispute. So it sounds to me like in that kind of a case, everybody probably needs to have some legal counsel. Um, Amy said an emotional support animal is also based on a doctor's note. There are no breed requirements um, of service dogs. That is true. That is absolutely correct. Um, and Michael said my husband, Michelle, I'm sorry, said my husband has a lab pit mix and that is his support animal. It, it's irrespective of breed there have, or type of animal. There have been people who have had emotional support peacocks. And the challenge came when trying to bring the peacock on a plane. That made people nag at me because, you know, peacocks don't fly without a crate. I don't know that they fly at all in terms of being airborne in the, uh, in the stratosphere with an airplane. But, but it caused a whole stir because who wants a peacock flying without a cage in the body of an airliner? You know, that, that certainly infringes on other people's rights. So um, breed restrictions, Amy said, do not apply to service dogs. No, absolutely not. And uh, breed restrictions really are being challenged in any number of places, but it tends to be that homeowners associations that have uh, legacy laws, not even laws, legacy rules within their HOA may have wording in their docs and declarations that specify that certain types of dogs can't live in that community, that has been challenged all over the place as it has been challenged in municipalities. And, um, and that is no longer something in many places that somebody can claim, can, can claim. But if we look at the next page, we find out that ours is not to reason why. That was an old expression of my mother's. I think the saying went, ours is but to do or die. I, you know, let's not. But, but I think that uh, it is definitely not ours to have an opinion about this issue. We simply need, need to raise the flag and let it be known that there is an issue where emotional support animals come into play and may be causing a problem. Somebody just said insurance companies won't insure high risk dogs and that could have effects. That is true. Thanks, Junie. Um, that could have an effect on home ownership, but that is something, and especially in a rental situation, uh, that is something where we would want to be escalating that again to someone who is not responsible for the sale or rental of the property, but someone who could give that buyer or tenant a really good legal opinion. They would need to consult with their own attorney and you would need to consult with our legal department. Can a person with a support animal require HOAs or homeowners to provide areas for defecation, et cetera? I, that's a good question, April. I don't know the answer to that one. I think that that would probably be on an individual basis. I have not seen any laws in the things that I've studied that would indicate that. Um, it's interesting. Amy said, emotional support animals are still pet service dogs are not. Actually, that is not the way that fair housing law looks at it. <coughs> Excuse me. Hang on. Fair housing law actually looks at... <coughs> both emotional support animals and service animals <coughs> as needing to be treated properly. 
And so where either comes to our attention, we have to be very careful that it's not our opinion or our input that someone is basing a decision on. Let's see. You can request, Michael says, that the tenant provide the insurance at their expense. But again, that is not, uh, that may be true. That may be true. But that is not ours to intervene in. I think that anytime you have somebody who's bringing in any kind of an animal that may cause consternation or questions, they need to get proper legal advice and you need to consult with our legal uh, expertise in our legal department and write down at the bottom of our page, I have what our position is on this. Our position is that this, this is all Howard Hanna policy right here. When showing properties to clients for whom this is a concern, our involvement would be limited to accommodating the prospect or client and their need to have the animal join them when viewing properties, alerting sellers, landlords, or showing services, that such an animal would accompany you on the showing, and that is really important. We need to let the showing service know that so that they can alert the seller if that's going to be an issue regarding allergies or anything else. And directing questions, uh, you can direct questions directly from your, your tenant or uh, buyer to the Department of Justice, to the Civil Rights Division, and you can talk to your manager and your manager would consult with any angle who's our chief legal counsel and her department. So that's the contact information there. I've put some resources over on the right side of the page from the Department of Justice and HUD, and those would be additional areas to read up on this topic, because if there's anything out there in the marketplace right now where there's a lot of misconception going on, this is it. And so you can take your support badger, as you see right here, that is a badger who is for anxiety prevention for his person, and, uh, and, you know, really, if you want a badger in your house, I'm not sure. So it's interesting. Um, when I looked up emotional support animals online and asked for images, he showed up, a skunk showed up, a pot-bellied pig showed up. They're very, very popular, a million different breeds of dogs, but this is a biggie. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to dwell on it anymore today. So I want to flip back to the other topic of gender identity. Many of us remember this um, Caitlyn Jenner cover of Vanity Fair. And just to take it back for a second to this concept of the immutable characteristics. And by definition, when they were looked at at the time that the Civil Rights Law of 64 was being put in place and the Fair Housing Law, immutable characteristics were identified as being any sort of physical attribute that is perceived as being unchangeable, entrenched, and innate. So where do we go with that when it comes to persons who fall into the gender identity spectrum as transgender, as transvestite? Where does that all fall? Is it about having the Y chromosome? That's never going to go away. And we can have hormonal therapy, and that's not necessarily going to change the identity with which we were born to the point where all of those characteristics are completely obliterated. It will change them in, uh, in either a permanent or impermanent way, but it doesn't completely take away that gender identity um, is something that is being considered and that is very controversial to this day. Now, if you look at the court cases on this, there were six separate studies in which 20 to 57% of transgender individuals said that they had experienced employment discrimination and that they were fired, denied a promotion or harassed, and also in uh, housing, rental, and sale had experienced discrimination. But in housing, in rental and sale, this topic is protected now under the category of sex, which was previously uh, relegated only to male and female now gender identity cases in the court system in the United States are also being held under these uh, guidelines of gender identity. So that is something that we need to take a look at. Now, you may remember from a couple of years ago, a lady by the name of Rachel Dolezal. She was someone who positioned herself within the African-American community. She actually was heading a community organization that was um, for the betterment of persons who identified as Black. And at that point, the picture on the left is what Rachel looked like. And when it came out that she was not a person who was born black, and uh, it's kind of interesting. She said that she identified as black, but she was not born 
into that racial category. So is race an immutable characteristic or is it a, merit, a, a matter of choice? Can you be, as Rachel described herself, someone who is transracial? Let's see what you have to say about that. Okay. All righty. I'm not seeing anything much on this. Um, Maggie just suggested, and it's a good idea uh, to remind everybody that we at Howard Hanna have legal counsel. Many other brokerages do not. If you've invited any guests who are not from Howard Hanna, you would need to consult with your own brokerage on how such issues are dealt with within your company. And that would be something that would always be uh, the case. But um, Miriam said, wow, it's up to the person. And Patricia said, I don't know. Somebody else said, and said, no, it's not part of DNA. And uh, who is to say, and who are we to say differently? I would say maybe it depends on the neighborhood environment that you grew up in. I think it might. I think that it goes back to that question of nature versus nurture and what someone is strongly compelled to feel that they're part of, you know, but again, it goes into that thing of how do people themselves want to be treated? Um, Sharon said, race is a protected class, so why do we care if they think of themselves as another race? Good question. Very good question. You know, a lot of this just takes us back to the question of why do people feel like they have to have an opinion? I've never really fully understood that. Um, and uh, Miriam said she was raised by an activist in the 60s. Yeah, a lot of us who are children of the 60s or a children of people who were raising us in the 60s. Um, and Anne said, sorry, I mean, it is identified in the DNA. That's really interesting. So, you know, I, part of my job in doing this class and part of the pleasure that I get in doing this class is really just encouraging everybody to think and look at things perhaps a little differently. And these questions that we're, we're tumbling around with today really will make you do that. So talk about it, talk about it with friends and family members. Uh, talk about it among among your peer groups and see what people think about it. I will be sending you the PDF of these PowerPoints and uh, and let's let's pay attention to that somebody just said choice decisions, not ours to judge. Well, here's another area that has been a frontier recently in discrimination claims, and that is of criminal history. The question of if someone perhaps has a criminal past, but uh, they have done their duty to, to take care of uh, fulfilling the responsibilities of whatever that may have involved and doing their time. Criminal history and persons who have um, had a criminal history is not in itself a protected class, but criminal history-based restrictions on housing opportunities have created what they call a disparate impact on certain protected classes. So there's an intersection there. So race, color, national origin, those people in those groups may experience things differently from people in other majority groups where persons might not be judged suitable for a rental, where people in the neighborhood may not want a certain person. This would uh, come in, in heavily with if there were sex crimes committed. That uh, our, I live in a homeowners association and our homeowners association walked right up to the idea of saying that we didn't want people who had been convicted of sex crimes uh, to live in the neighborhood. I, I think that's an incredible affront. I really do. Um, I think that there are lots of reasons that people can't live in certain places. And if someone is actually on the registry for sex offenders and has prohibitions that prohibit them from living in certain places, that's one thing. But an HOA determining what they call NIMBY, not in my backyard, that's a whole other ballgame. So I call this one to your attention because it may very well be something that you encounter in the field and in your dealings with people who are seeking housing. So just to give you an idea of some of the headlines that came into play in 2019, New Jersey condominium community paid $30,000 to settle a dog dispute where they uh, had allegations of discrimination against a resident who had disabilities by saying that she couldn't have her dog as an assistance animal. Tons of those in the news. New York landlord paid 400,000 to settle a sexual harassment claim from a tenant. Texas landlords charged with race discrimination 
saying that it was a fair housing issue by refusing to lease a room to a prospective client, a prospective tenant because she was black. And HUD actually levied housing discrimination claims in uh, 2019, saying that Facebook violated the Fair Housing Act by encouraging, enabling, and causing housing discrimination through the company's advertising platform. So let's just take a look at that. Facebook case is one of the most landmark cases that we've dealt with in recent times. We, of course, are closing in on four o'clock, but hang in there with me and we'll keep going until we finish. Uh, I charged that Facebook was violating the Fair Housing Act, encouraging, enabling, and causing housing discrimination through their Facebook advertising platform. They said that the discrimination was based on the seven federally protected classes by restricting who could view housing related ads on Facebook's platforms and also alleging that Facebook mines the data. Data is huge right now, gang, and it mines the data about its users. Facebook knows everything about us. They know where I want my watch bands, um, but they use that data then to choose who views housing ads partially based on their protected class characteristics. So the allegations said that advertisers to ch could choose according to or choosing to exclude people who were parents, either men or women, non-American born, people who were non-Christian or Christian, interested in accessibility, interested in Hispanic culture, and a huge variety of other categories of human life. It also alleged that advertisers could exclude people based on their neighborhoods by drawing a red line around the neighborhood on the map. That is a classic modern day case of redlining, where people do not want to participate in a certain area and they denote that based on what the red line tells them. So the charge was that Facebook uses these protective characteristics to determine who will see certain ads, and then they combine that data with what they know to be the user behavior matrix, creating what they call predictive analytics. Now I have to tell you, every modern day company that's in existence uses this kind of algorithm to some degree. Everybody who has a website uses predictive analytics to determine what actions people are going to take. But predictive analytics are not something that you should be using to exclude people from seeing things that otherwise they would be able to see. So the charge became that by grouping users with similar behaviors and interests, totally unrelated to housing, just their patterns, and presuming a shared interest in housing related ads, that Facebook functions just like an advertiser who intentionally targets or excludes users based on their protective class. So again, we go back to intent versus impact. I don't know, was Facebook's intent to discriminate? Maybe, maybe not, we'll never know. We won't know what was in Mark Zuckerberg's mind or his team's mind, but the impact was that certain people were included, certain people were excluded, and we don't know yet what the outcome of that's going to be. The prosecutor in this case, in making his case, said that even as we confront new technologies, the fair housing laws enacted over half a century ago remain clear. Discrimination in housing related advertising is against the law, period. Just because a process to deliver advertising is opaque, you can't see through it, and complex doesn't mean that it exempts Facebook and others from our scrutiny and the law of the land. Fashioning appropriate remedies and the rules of the road for today's technology as, its impact, as it impacts housing are a priority for HUD, which is prosecuting this case. HUD's charge is going to be heard by a U.S. administrative law judge unless uh, any party to the charge elects to have it heard in federal court. That case is still pending and it's gonna be a landmark case for fair housing issues. So uh, really, really interesting stuff. This is actually something that uh, you can take a look at in greater depth when I send you the PDF, just in the interest of time. This was something that came in a couple of years ago relative to Craigslist, where a group of lawyers in Chicago said that Craigslist discriminated by violating the Fair Housing Act, allowing uh, ads that said things like Catholic Church and beautiful Buddhist temple within one block in a post and that that was a sign of religious preference. 
Craigslist came back with an argument that said, well, we're just helping people zero in on the properties and we're not the ones who posted it. We're just the conduit through which that post flowed. Interesting outcome in this case was that uh, by the time this landed in the Court of Appeals, Craigslist won and the court found that they were just the messenger and were not actually liable for any discriminatory posts on their site. A lot of people have found that one to be very interesting. Um, so Danielle said, I listed a home where a seller had a restraining order against the next door neighbor's boyfriend who had trespassed, peeked in windows and said highly inappropriate things um, of a sexual nature, but was told that I could not mention it to anyone as he'd not been convicted of a crime and we could be guilty of slander or libel, yeah, as I, uh, if I did. There were no convic uh, convictions against him and I lost sleep. I worried about someone buying the home and that could possibly be a target of this person. And it, it bothered him, it aided him. And thankfully the buyer didn't appear to be the one, this, the, it, this house didn't be the one that met his interest. But morally, I was gutted by the inability to tell a potential buyer of this issue. You know, that is an outstanding point and one that's a real challenge. And it's one that we deal with in a number of different arenas. Um, and we talk about it in a number of different classes. And that is one, boy, take that kind of a problem to your managers, please. That is not something that you have to deal with alone ever. You're in this company again with this wedge of people behind you to help you. Uh, if you if you can't get help from your managers, call me. We'll we'll get it through the system. And I I honestly I talk to your managers all the time. They are wanting to help you with stuff like this. Please please involve them, and uh, and we will get that no matter where it comes in within the company. Anybody will make sure that that type of issue gets you some help because you just don't have to deal with that alone. So just to wrap up today, gang, thank you so much for being with us. Um, we've really covered intent versus impact. We have really taken a very serious look at your patterns of practice and how we all have to fulfill those baselines of expectations. The thing that we need to know is that requiring that somebody be pre-approved to buy a home is not discrimination. In fact, it is really the opposite of discrimination. It is ensuring that the seller has the opportunity to show their home and have it sold to someone who can actually afford to buy it. The bottom line for me in talking about all of this is the fact that we're all just people. We are all just people who wanna be treated as all people wanna be treated fairly and with equitable um, outcomes for us. We all want the same things, we need the same things. We provide one of the, the foundational elements of what Every human being has a right to want and expect of food, clothing, and shelter. We bring people home every day. And that's a really sacred obligation in my mind because we're the ones who do it. We're the gatekeepers. And we want that feeling that people get us. We want to feel that people honor us because they are aware of who we are and they respect us in our personhood. So I'm just gonna take a quick look at the questions and answers that we had. We had a couple of things come up. Um, Anya here in our Cleveland market said, on the phone, people hear my accent. I think that that is something that lots of people deal with both on the, uh, the provider side of things and the person who's calling in to acquire assistance with buying or finding a house. Uh, we, we have had a lot of studies done to that effect, Anya, and uh, you're not alone by any means. Uh, there is a phenomenon called dialing while black, where somebody on the other end of the phone hears you sounding as though you are a person of color in their mind. I don't know necessarily what that sounds like, but somebody determines that and you are treated differently. It's just one of the many things that we have to be aware of, unfortunately, that um, our sensibilities are heightened to the idea that everybody, whether they're on the phone or sitting in the reception area, they deserve the same kind of treatment. Um, may I say on MLS advertising that a house is handicap friendly? You certainly may. And that is an excellent question. Handicap, actually, I wouldn't say it's handicap friendly. I would say that it's um, handicap accessible or accessible for disabilities because that is an amenity. That is actually something that means that the house has been modified 
to accommodate persons with certain types of disabilities. So yes, uh, I'm not sure where the MLS necessarily accounts for that, but there's often a checkbox that says that. And um, yeah, and uh, so basically keep those things in mind. Let me just check chat over here for one second. If I can get it to appear again, chat just seems to have disappeared. Okay, hello, and then that's, that is the end. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. If I can get this to stop share. Okay, so now it looks like it's just you and me. So in chat, do we have anything new? We do bring people home every day. Thank you, Mary Jane, I love that one. Of course you may, um, that's, that's kind of my slogan. I think that what we do is as heroic as people who are on the front lines of any other kind of important career. And the fact that you are out there providing homes to people who need them. I think, as Phil Dunphy said on Modern Family, realtors are uh, superheroes in a blazer. So absolutely. And um, Roman said, I use my knowledge and my native of my native language to an advantage. That is an ability to communicate. And uh, it's especially helpful with new immigrants. Anybody who has a linguistic skill, please be sure that that language capacity is something that you note on our website and take advantage of in sharing that information about how you can provide assistance to other people in the marketplace who may need it, whether they're your colleagues or the people who are coming in to buy and sell homes with us. So I can't thank you all enough for being with us for this series and for uh, hanging with me over the past several weeks. And, um, and oh, thank you, Valerie. Um, but, you know, it's been a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak to all of Hannah Land uh, with a lot of very expansive information. I am here, Jackie Casera at howardhanna.com. If there's any question that you have, uh, please, there is nothing that you need to be afraid of discussing or asking, and I will get you an answer. If I don't know the answer, I do know where to go for it. So by all means, and uh, Kim, thank you again for your very thoughtful sharing. I promise that I won't put everybody on a PowerPoint and stick you on screen. I did get Kim's permission before putting her on here today, but um, thank you all, and thanks for taking the time to be with us, and hopefully we will see you all within the next couple of weeks on other webinars as we go forward. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.